is Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed, a series-based podcast focusing on surgical and medical education and featuring expert interviews and practice-changing discussion. Our host is Dr. Kara King, a member of the Cleveland Clinic's section of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. Dr. King is also the director of benign gynecologic surgery and associate program director of the Cleveland Clinic's MIGS Fellowship. This podcast is a collaboration between MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons. We'll be right back after this message. This podcast is made possible by Boston Scientific. To learn more about Boston Scientific, please visit bostonscientific.com. The opinions expressed in this podcast belong solely to the featured clinicians and do not necessarily reflect the views of Boston Scientific. I am so excited to be sitting down with Dr. Barry Ridgway. She is our fearless leader here at the Women's Health Institute at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. She is trained in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, but she is currently our institute chair here in Cleveland and is leading us through this entire COVID pandemic um, and is doing an amazing job. So Dr. Ridgway, thank you for spending time with us this morning. Thank you. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about this. Would you be able to talk to us just about where we are currently in this COVID pandemic in regards to Ohio? Mm -hmm. Right. It's interesting because when we're talking about this pandemic, it does have to be very geography specific and very time specific. And the information that I'll be providing right now is a little bit dated because it's from yesterday. And by the time people are hearing this podcast, it potentially can totally change. As far as the curve in the pandemic, we're still in the very beginning of that here in Ohio. And it's hard for us to even tell which type of curve we're on and which curve we're going to mimic based on some pretty strict regulations that the state has recommended. We're hoping that those will place us on a better curve, but we won't know for probably the next 10 to 14 days. You're exactly right in that you said this is outdated information because it's from last night. I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but it's so true, right? Like 12 hours makes such a big difference in this. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I feel like I am living a week every single day. And we'll think back to what some people jokingly are calling BC before COVID. Um, our, <laughs> our, <good>. our, <laughs> our life before that, where we, where we would be, you know, arguing about cost centers or how the division will handle travel and things that now I look back and are such a luxury. (laughs) Right. They seem so small now. And things change so quickly that it's hard to keep up. And it's a challenge to communicate. And that's why I appreciate this opportunity for the podcast, but also communications we've done within the Institute frequently, because information does change quite rapidly. Exactly right. So as of last night, do you know how many cases were total within Ohio itself? So within Ohio, as of last night, there were 704 patients in the state who had tested positive for COVID. That included 182 who required hospitalization. And within that, there were 75 who were in the ICU and included 10 deaths. That does not include total patients under investigation or PUIs. So that number is quite a bit higher Though I know at least in Northeast Ohio, we have greatly increased our testing ability. And in fact, we do the great majority of the testing for the whole state. And so uh, I imagine that part of the numbers will continue to increase just because we'll more rapidly increase our ability to test. And when we look at the Ohio maps, it looks like our county does have the highest number of positive cases. Is that strictly because of the testing ability that we have here in this county, though? Yes. It's hard to say. I can't say that it's not that we're higher, but I do know just from the amount of testing that we're doing that we've done the most testing in the state. And so with that, of course, we would know the most positive answers. Right now, we have completed over 6,200 tests, which is a, a massive amount to get even testing up and going. And that's only been, gosh, over maybe a week or 10 days now that I'm losing track of all the time. Um, And so most recently, our positive rate is 7.9%. Okay, got it. Can you talk to us a little bit about what the enterprise has done in regard to testing sites? So Mm -hmm. how many testing sites do we have available right now? 
Right now we have one testing site available and that's located near our main campus. It is a drive-through testing site and it will be for employees and others with appointments where you drive through, they uh, verify information and then do a swab right there and send you on your way. That has evolved over time and uh, it partly has to do with partnerships that we have formed and also our change in testing strategy because in a pandemic, the testing strategy changes from wanting to screen more liberally, isolate versus then testing people where it's going to have an impact on their job or on the diagnosis. Exactly right. So what does our testing criteria look like right now? Who are we allowed to test? That's a great question. And because it changes, I actually printed an algorithm. (laughs) (laughs) I tell you, I know every day. (laughs) So we have two different major algorithms. And first and foremost, we are testing individuals who are symptomatic. We are not doing other types of screening at this time. And not that that's a bad strategy. The real reason we're not screening more broadly has to do with our resources and actually a shortage nationwide of swabs. So we're having to really allocate those resources. So the first thing is that someone would need one of the following, and that would be fever greater than 100.4, cough, shortness of breath or diarrhea. That's been a new addition because Mm -hmm. there's more reports about there being GI symptoms with this Mm -hmm. virus as opposed to initially where it was sounded a lot like influenza with cough and fever. Mm -hmm. So for someone who is a patient, if they feel unwell, if they are part of an oncology group or in cancer treatment, they will immediately be tested. If they are not part of that cancer group, the outpatient provider will recommend this COVID testing. This will then route them to a hotline that does a secondary screening. Because as you can imagine, initially people were putting a billion orders in that was creating chaos and also a shortage of supplies for the highest risk patients. So once the outpatient provider recommends this, this gets routed to the hotline, someone will review that information and performs a modified screening that looks at risk factors, for example, age, whether they have active immunosuppression, dialysis, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, et cetera. And then they screen high risk positive, they are scheduled for that drive-through. If they are screened low risk, then they uh, no order is placed and they are informed to call back if their symptoms worsen. Got it. (laughs) For caregivers, it's a little bit different. And the rationale is that with our caregivers, we need to know whether they can work or not because we don't want them to come and transmit the infection as part of their job. So if they're feeling unwell, they call it with the same criteria that I discussed before. They will call the caregiver hotline. The hotline will go over the testing criteria, which is very simple. And if they have any of those symptoms, an order is placed and they go through the drive through So it sounds like a lot of this is being done virtually, right? So not a lot of in-person appointments, a lot of virtual visits and then drive through Is that right? Absolutely. From the beginning, we realized that you don't really need to perform a physical exam or see someone personally in order to decide who should get tested, who shouldn't, and then also who ultimately needs care. So we've done a lot through the telephone, and then we've had a successful virtual visit platform that we've continued to expand. And just like for a lot of our other regular patient type visits, we're doing this almost exclusively virtually. And that is one aspect that I've been so happy that we had a really robust virtual platform before this Mm -hmm. pandemic. And so I feel like here, especially it's been a fairly easy transition to move to mostly virtual because a lot of us were already trained on that and we're used to that platform. I think that is great. And I think we had a good footing with that. I think that this is one of the unintended but perhaps positive consequences of this is learning how much we can do virtually, how we can really meet our patient where they are. And so people are really seeing firsthand about that. And also a little bit of relaxation of the laws in the pandemic have really expanded that so that we can use FaceTime, we can use Google Duo, and we can use telephone and still bill for that, which I think long term, I'm hoping to be have this extended, because I think it really allows us to connect with our patients when they need that connection. And of course, bring them in when we have deemed it necessary. Yeah, 
That's a, it's a very, very good point. So one aspect that I've heard from patients in the past when I've offered virtual visits is that their insurance wouldn't cover those virtual visits. And so they had to come in and see me, not because they wanted to necessarily, but because they had to in regard to coverage. Can you speak upon insurance coverage for virtual visits and how we're navigating that? Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting question because I do think that was a barrier, though, in the last six months leading up to this, more places have agreed to cover it because I think insurance has realized that it actually costs them less in the long run to provide care this way. But with this pandemic and us understanding that we wanted to distance patients to protect them by keeping them at home, as an organization, we decided we will bill as usual, but any part of a virtual visit, telephone encounter, et cetera, that is not covered by their insurance, we are considering charity care, so we are not charging the patients. And I think that's important because that kind of cost should not be a barrier. That's amazing. And that really just shows, you know, our motto that patients come first here and that their care overrides insurances sometimes. So I'm really proud that our institution is doing that. It is interesting in times like this when organizations really are focused on their values, they shine through in moments like this. You're so right. True colors come through, and I'm really proud of us right now, for sure. So we're obviously doing all the typical measures, right? Hand hygiene and cough etiquette and social distancing, all those things. And for the love of God, don't touch your face, right? We know this. I can't do that part, but (laughs) I I try. (laughs) I never realized how many times I touch my face in in a minute, actually. (laughs) A minute, yes. It's not in hours, it's in seconds. (laughs) It's in seconds, exactly. What other things are we doing here? Can you talk about, you know, our visitation policies mm-hmm. and other things we're doing for staff to make sure we're minimizing spread? Yep. So we are being very aggressive about this and have really been early adopters for a lot of these policies. Our visitation policy has very quickly went to zero visitors. And that is something that's very important. It helps keep people at home. This is for inpatient and outpatient. So for inpatient, the only carve-outs are we're allowing one person in with someone who's laboring and then one parent for pediatric patients. End of life, even, they're doing case by case. And we're trying to provide virtual rounding with patient families connecting with iPads and other ways. It's obviously extremely hard, but we really have to do this for the good of everyone. Also, we have now implemented temperature checks of staff and patients upon entry so that we can screen and make sure that people with who have active fevers are not coming into our institution. We have implemented a facial hair policy. <laughs> Luckily, oh my it doesn't affect me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so many jokes for yeah. um, for men <laughs> who have uh, beards and I guess it's mainly beards and not mustaches. I, I'd have to look at it to be honest. I yeah. haven't reviewed it in full detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that their mask fitting is better, and then of course strict hand hygiene, new checkpoints all over the hospital with hand sanitizer. We have sent people home who can work from home which has been a help to just decant the critical numbers who are usually in cubicles and and other things. And then we have moved to very limited meetings, ideally no more than five people, six feet apart, and use of WebEx and Skype. Though I have to say that if COVID doesn't kill me, Skype will. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my level of eye dryness has gone up like 15-fold. Yes, yes. I know, I hear you. We'll be right back after this message. There's been a lot of talk about everybody wearing masks. Mm -hmm. I know out in Boston that has been a new push where everybody is wearing masks all of the time. What are our thoughts currently on that Mm -hmm. situation? I think it's a great question, and I can assure you that it is being discussed at the highest level and quite a bit. And on one hand, we want to preserve our PPE, especially we are in the beginning of this On the other hand, we want to protect our caregivers as much as we can and to decrease that spread. We have taken a very evidence-based approach to this and at this time are not recommending masks for everyone. Some would say that using a mask will help reduce anxiety and that may be true, but I don't think that is the best reason to dip into PPE. 
And so at this time, there is a no masks for everyone policy. It partly has to do with you can incur more risk by using a mask improperly. And also there is the issue of what's preventing a transmission with droplets. That'd be you wearing the mask, right? Mm -hmm. So if we go to a caregiver all mask policy, it's actually just protecting the patients from us, Mm -hmm. not really the other way around. Right. But we have focused on strict PPE, and then we're reevaluating that every day. It's not a no and that conversation ends. It's let's continue to critically evaluate the literature that's out there, um, the recommendations are out there, and then we have the frank and crucial conversations with our ID specialists. I like using evidence-based tactics, and I trust that there are many, many really smart people here evaluating that on a daily basis, just like you said. So Mm -hmm. I trust that decision is very well backed. There are, and these are hard decisions because on one hand, we want to make everyone feel better, but if it actually isn't going to help, then it is maybe not the best policy at this time as long as we're open to continually reevaluating that. So I know some institutions that haven't started the masks for everyone policy. There's individual providers who feel more comfortable wearing their mask, despite not having everyone mandated to wear the mask. Are providers here allowed to wear the mask if they want to, or are we encouraging them not to? We're encouraging them not to. Yeah, there's no evidence to support that right now. Right, and I think we as an organization have to make these difficult decisions and implement them. And then, of course, as I said, reconsider them. But to have carve-outs of this person doing this, this person doing that, and ultimately it dipping into the critical supplies of PPE for people who are going to be needing them in two, three weeks can create a problem. Actually, more problems than, than now. Yes, exactly right. So I want to talk a little bit about the modeling that has been done here at the Enterprise in an attempt to predict the numbers that we should anticipate here in Northeast Ohio. Are you able to expand on what factors went into creating these three models and what they look like? Mm-hmm. So the models that were created here were initially based on models that were developed at University of Pennsylvania that were fantastic. We have adapted them and worked with our Quantitative Health Sciences Institute and other modeling experts to model as we learn more and more about COVID and how this pandemic is working. I mean, the big variables are really the percent social distancing, the percent of individuals who require hospitalization, and those really are the unknowns. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it goes into the population, the market share, et cetera, so that we can contingency plan for a surge in a worst case scenario. And these numbers are actually hard to even grasp, Mm -hmm. right? It just, it's, it's, they're just so incredibly large. And that's one reason why we really reduced our surgical volume to only include essential surgeries and have deferred non-essential operations for quite some time in order to prepare for this. So based on these models, when are we expected to peak here in Northeast Ohio? So assuming we're on that 0% social distancing, the peak would be in mid-May. And again, these are models, and models are imperfect, so it's hard to tell. And in a best-case scenario where we flatten that curve, the peak actually extends much later, closer to beginning of August. And so on one hand, we want to flatten the curve because we would ultimately have enough hospital resources to treat everyone. On the other hand, it's going to increase the amount of time that we are going to be focused entirely on this. And we want that, but I think it's important to know we're in this for a marathon. This is not a sprint. And that this is going to be a new way of life. And we also don't know very much about the virus as far as we make assumptions that it's seasonal like the flu. I hope so. (laughs) Right. These are things we just don't know that we'll have to learn and then continually adjust the model, which I think is really important. Right. You know, you're right. This is really a surreal time Mm -hmm. in that, like right now, we're, I don't know, fortunate, not fortunate to have a couple of weeks to keep preparing. But during that stage, you're right, it builds anxiety. It's like for what's about to come. And so in these times of stress, 
you know, it really lets leadership shine through and true colors shine through like we've spoken about. And you've done a really phenomenal job. You really I feel have. like I fail every day, but I just keep trying. <laughs> no. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, at communication and keeping everybody in the loop. And it's sometimes hard to make these webinars oftentimes because we don't have final answers. And I could see from a leadership standpoint, I'd be hesitant about holding these meetings until I knew more. But the reality is that we just don't know more necessarily. And so I really appreciate and value you for holding these still. Yeah, no, I think that that's been important. And I, like you, like to have all the answers and know the exact message that I want to convey. But I've just really transitioned to communicating often and imperfectly and then communicating again, (laughs) which I've asked from the beginning that I want to be as transparent as I can, share everything that I know with the end user also knowing that I'm going to be changing that and updating as time goes on. Being flexible, being nimble, yes, <laughs> being truly a humble leader, that is you, that's right. So in regard to our elective surgeries, at this time, how long have they been discontinued? They were postponed beginning no later than March 18th. And the week leading up to this, we did a ton of work operationally with the enterprise and then within each department or institute to have a very clear-cut plan on how we would wind down. And so we spent, which seems like months, but we spent a few days winding down. And then by March 18th, stopped all non-essential operations. And we worked really with everyone to have an understanding of their individual surgical book of business from the department standpoint so that we had cases in different criteria. I called all my patients this week and informed them of this suspension of our cases. And the majority of them were very understanding. You mm-hmm. know, patients understand the gravity of the situation and it's safest for them. It's, it's you know, it's best for the patients who could become sick. So I think overall, this is really a um, come together, stronger together type situation, which is, which is nice to see. Yeah, we're having a big ask of our patients and of our doctors and our APPs and the great majority are all in. That part, I think, is is a little energizing to see everyone kind of come together. So another thing I want to talk with you about is how we are handling our emergency rooms, because I think we've been pretty innovative in the planning of how we're handling the emergency rooms in regard to COVID patients and as well as our OBGYN patients. Can you talk about how we are enrolling a new system here? Mm -hmm. So individuals who come to the emergency room with gynecologic complaints and those who are under 20 weeks pregnant we've actually created a super track and that's what we're calling it here where it's a standalone site where within our system we have a number of different emergency departments and locations and we're going to have two super tracks one on the east side of cleveland and one on the west side of cleveland and what will happen is someone the triage nurse or an app in the emergency department will screen them for covid symptoms get the chief complaint make sure their vitals are normal or within normal range and then send them to a super track and the super tracks are for OBGYN, plastics orthopedics and eye And the idea is to get these patients outside of the ED for their own protection, as well as just to create capacity in the emergency department. And also it helps our providers who are there to evaluate gynecologic complaints to stay out of the ED, which is at some point going to be one of the more acute areas in what we consider a hot zone. So we're standing up near offices that we already have that will have providers there at least initially from seven to 11, seven days a week. And we'll see anything from first trimester bleeding, workup for ectopic, STIs, UTIs, Bartholin cysts, et cetera, and can be treated on site there. And we also will have ultrasound capability and can do everything that we normally would do in an ED. That's great. And so 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., right? Seven Correct. days a week. Yep. I think it's great take some of the providers, Mm -hmm. aka MIGs (laughs) and REI and Eurogyne and, you know, us providers who have an 80% decrease in our work volume and let us stay within our field, Mm -hmm. right? And be reallocated that way. I think Mm -hmm. it's a creative solution. I think the goal is to keep people in their area of expertise as long as possible. And Mm -hmm. that's the goal so that we have a super track, we can treat our patients efficiently. And then also at some point realize that we'll probably need to condense that 
and we'll need to redeploy our physicians and APPs to help with the general inpatient population. Exactly right. So can you talk a little bit about the redeployment strategy of WHI, the Women's Health Institute, the plan for us over the next couple Mm -hmm. of months? Sure. So as I said, the short-term plan is to keep people in their area as long as possible. But even now, the volumes in those areas are down 80%. And I imagine in one or two weeks, it'll be down 90 to 95%. Because all of a sudden, that quality of life issue doesn't seem so bad when you're hearing on the news about what's happening in the hospitals. So we're creating right now a surge plan so that we have the workforce that can treat a worst case scenario, the one that I just described, in fact. And with that, we will be redeploying our surgical subspecialists, our APPs, and a few OBGYNs to a work pool. And... For OBGYN, we're mainly going to be having to back up ourselves and all be available to help within labor and delivery those who have OB privileges and skill. So what we're doing is we're looking per service line and collapsing that service line to probably one doctor and one APP. And we'll monitor volumes. And of course, oncology is a little bit different. They're only down about 20% or so. And so this will affect them a little less. They'll probably need three or four of their docs and APPs. So once the service line is collapsed and um, managed entirely by that one doctor and one APP, the remainder of physicians and APPs will go into this pool. And then we're working in the enterprise to create teams So it won't be that you, Kara King, Miggs, specialist extraordinaire is going to be managing (laughs) event or running a team. And the goal is to support one another, but obviously not be irresponsible. I love that. I think all of us really want to help and are passionate about helping and are not running from this. But at the same time, we want to make sure that our patients are safe under our skill set. So I love that you're taking our energy, really looking at what we excel in and then placing us in those roles. That's reassuring for me. No, I think it is. And because when I would think like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to round on these patients and make decisions on things that I can hardly remember from medical school, I said, oh, but I can be a team member. I can bring the team together. I can make the phone calls. I can be a liaison if you need me to run something from one place to the other. Like, that's usually not what I do, but I'm happy to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. All right, I have one last question for you, Dr. Ridgway, because I know you have a webinar for us in about 15 minutes. Yes. Again, talking <laughs> about frequent communication, you are amazing at that. So my last question is about just supporting your staff emotionally. So mm-hmm. again, you're taking a bunch of surgical subspecialists. We all just want to operate five days a week if we could. Right. Taking that away from us, it's a real big mental shift, and I'm already missing the OR, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's a big shift for us. So what kind of things are you doing to help support your staff in this dynamic time? Mm-hmm. So I think the first part of it, as we've talked about already, is just sharing information. I think that in the absence of that information or the absence of that plan, people become more anxious and there's just a little higher level of chaos, generally speaking. Also, because we're all leaders, we, as especially surgeons, we decide to implement our own plans many times. And those may not be consistent with what's going to help the institute. It also duplicates efforts or it may be against what, as an enterprise, we've decided. And so I try to do that. I have been very careful and conscientious about checking in with our docs who are either out because of uh, quarantine or whether they are COVID positive and in self-isolation and making sure that they stay connected. And then there have been a number of wellness initiatives from the enterprise that include remote exercising because our exercise facilities are closed down. We have a caring for caregivers hotline that has psychology and counseling services available all the time. And then there's even a new hotline to call if you just need a like quick little boost. And I think also just showing gratitude. It's something I try to do. I hope that people feel it. Mm -hmm. It's hard sometimes when you are really anxious, but I am at the end of it so appreciative for everyone and really seeing people step up um, and be willing and offering themselves up like, hey, you send me anywhere I want to help. I show gratitude, but I also like to share that with others. We're feeling it. I hope so. (laughs) I'm feeling it. It's hard when uh, it's uh, such a stressful time. Yeah, when you're living it too, but we all look to you to become, and you're just doing a really, really amazing job. I'm being honest. Thank you. So thank you for your leadership during this time. Yes, well, thanks. This has been um, fun to talk about. We can always improve and be better and, and learn from what other places are doing. Exactly. 
Well, thank you again, Dr. Ridgway. Best of luck for the rest of the next couple of weeks as this all unfolds. And we'll try to touch base again in a couple of weeks when things are probably a little bit different than they are today. That would be great. Great. Thank Thank you again. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye-bye. And that's all for this episode of Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed. Join us next episode for more expert insights and perspectives. From all of us at MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons, thanks for listening.